Amen. Good morning. I tell you, I thought I knew the book of Philippians, but studying this has been really good for me. I hope some of it's trickling down to you as well, and you're gaining something. I hope that, in fact, I know that many of you are reading the book of Philippians through the week, and that's great. Let me encourage you to, to keep on that path. Uh, we're talking about what brings joy, what brings true joy in your life. Not temporary fleeting happiness, but what brings joy, especially in the midst of pain, in the midst of marital troubles, job troubles, you've got a, a prodigal child that's away from God. How do you still experience joy in the midst of all that? Well, today we're going to talk about, is it the windshield or the rearview mirror? <laughs> and you kind of know where I'm going with that. But uh, let me just encourage you to take note of my number there, and we will have a Q&A at the end. And you can ask any question about this message or about the book of Philippians or just the Bible in general or just life in general. Any questions you have, even about Revolution Church, you can ask those questions. So today we're going to read through uh, the first uh, 14 verses. I'm going to read verse 1, and would you join me on verse 2, okay? And all the even verses after that. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Everybody in verse 2. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Def, definitely a ch change in tone, right? Everything has been kind of very happy-go-lucky up until now, and all of a sudden we're talking about mutilating the flesh. But anyway, we'll, we'll go through that here in a second. Verse 3 says, For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and the glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Verse 4. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Verse 5 says, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Benjamin, of the tri I'm sorry, people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Verse 8, everybody. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. That by any means possible I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Verse 12, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. And everybody together in verse 14. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Powerful passage of scripture. My original goal was to go through all of chapter 3. And by Wednesday I realized this ain't happening. I'm not making it through the whole chapter. Decided to cut it off. And so uh, we'll get through half of chapter 3 and we'll finish it next week. And we'll do windshield or rearview mirror next week as well. But one of the things that's been really good to see is to look at the chiastic structure. And we've learned that together, and that's been really cool. Several of you have texted me about that. Like you've read other passages. Someone the other day said they were reading through Micah, and they looked up the chiastic structure there. And like, wow, it's like everywhere. And um, so there's basically two in this passage right here. The first one. Verses 4 through 6, Paul talks about his righteousness through the flesh. He does it in a smack talk way, saying, oh, yeah, you think you're righteous? I'm more righteous than you are if you want to go that route. Okay? But he's not promoting it as, and this is what you should be. He's saying this is how lost he was, even though he was a very righteous person. And the passage in verse 9 ends with the righteousness that comes from God by faith. So there's the fleshly righteousness, and there's righteousness from God. Verse 7 and 8 9 uh, parallel each other. He talks about counting, counting things that are lost for Christ, and then talk about counting things as rubbish, that he may gain Christ. And then he reiterates that with verses 8 
the first part and the, and the latter part, counting things again as lost, and then for whom I have suffered loss of all things. And then, so basically, the core of the first half of this passage is this, and that's the way chiasm should work, is what is the core of this message? And the core of the first part of the passage is the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. If you get nothing else out of today, what you're supposed to get is knowing Jesus surpasses everything. Knowing him personally, knowing him powerfully, and knowing him painfully. The second part of the passage has its own little structure. It talks about the mind of the mature believer versus the mind of the enemies. Then it talks about how you should walk by the same rule and make note of people who walk in a godly way and follow them as well. Talk about your walk. And at the core of this is your mind. And, of course, the joy begins in what you choose to pour into your mind, what you choose to believe, what you choose to think about, and really what you choose to dwell on. Now, have you ever noticed certain thoughts are, like, haunting? Like, they, they just don't want to go away. And the only way you can make them go away is to replace them. How many of you ever had a bad song stuck in your head? Not, not necessarily bad as in immoral, but just stupid, you know? And they, I don't know how your brain works. I wake up with some of these songs. And I'm like, where did that come from? And the only way you get a song out of your head is what? Pick another song. Pick another song. It's true with your thought processes. If you feel yourself spiraling, getting negative, getting depressed, getting discouraged, the only way you break that cycle is stop it, replace it with a better thought. And that's why Philippians talks so much about thankfulness. Thankfulness is not just something that's turkey-oriented. It's something that should be every day, all throughout the day. You want to stop discouragement? You start replacing it with thankfulness and think of what you're thankful for. So there was a, a kid sitting next to his dad in church, and, and the, the preacher was, was preaching on and on and on. And then the preacher said, well, finally, my brethren. And the little boy goes, what does he mean by finally? And the dad looks up and says, absolutely nothing. You ever heard those preachers just they'll say finally, but then they go on? Well, here Paul, in the middle of the book, he's written two chapters, and then he says finally, and then he writes two more chapters. It's because finally in this context doesn't mean what we think it means. This is not a conclusion statement. He's saying with all that being said, now here's the transition. This is the pivot point to the second half where we'll, we will start the second half of this book. So that's what he means by finally. He's not being hyperbolic by the, any means, but he says rejoice in the Lord. Now, we rejoice about a lot of things, okay? Um, if you like the Rockets, you rejoice that they are doing well. If you like the Cowboys, you rejoice that they're eventually going to fire Jason Garrett. If you like whatever, okay, <laughs> you like him? Okay, so oh, you, you want him gone, right? Okay, good, good. I noticed the Texans sit on this side and the Cowboy fans sit on this side. So wait, what are you doing on that side? You're on the wrong side. Just kidding, just kidding. Um, Anyway, um, but there's a lot of different things we rejoice in, but ultimately our rejoicing is in who? Yeah, and notice it's not in what, it's in who. And you can think of some old Sonny and Cher songs, you know, about if you, we don't have anything, but I got you, babe, okay? Spiritually speaking is like if you have nothing, but you say, but I've got you, Jesus, that's what you're rejoicing in. It's not rejoicing in all the blessings of his hand, but rejoicing in his heart and knowing him and growing closer to him. And that's where your rejoicing needs to be in. Because if your rejoicing is in circumstances, what a roller coaster ride you're in for. <laughs> if your rejoicing is in finances, you are in for a big surprise and the emptiness that will be there. So our rejoicing is in our relationship with Christ and him personally. Then he makes an interesting statement. He says, the right to say things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. He's not referring to another letter he's written to the Philippians. He's saying what the same thing as the things he had said to them previously, and now to write these same things. So this is the first time he's writing to them, but he had said all these things in person. And he said, and it's safe for you. <clears throat> Remember, one of the unique things about the book of Philippians is he doesn't rebuke them for anything. The Galatians... He calls them foolish and bewitched. The Corinthians, he calls them carnal and fleshly. Uh, the Laodiceans, he call, John calls them, through Jesus, calls them lukewarm. In almost every book of the New Testament, there's a rebuke for that church. But in the Philippians, there's no rebuke, but there is a warning. And in almost every letter in the New Testament, the warning is against false teaching. Against false teaching. 
Uh, it was referenced in a 9 o'clock video that uh, Ephesus was pounding doctrine, pounding doctrine, pounding doctrine, and they still didn't obey that call, and if Ephesus church died because they didn't pay attention to their doctrine. So he's saying, I'm going to warn you because it would be safe. And there's many things that you will hear in the Christian life, in church, in your Bible reading, listening to Christian you know, podcasts. You will hear things, well, I've heard that before. I've heard that before. i heard that before. That's good. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff you need to hear over and over again because it's safe for you. I know there was one person you know, a few years ago criticized my preaching because I reviewed too much. And I'm like, but did you remember it all? You know, I had four major points. Do you know what they were? Well, blah, blah, blah. And that's why I review. Because, and also, it's not about you because I have people who've walked in, and this is their first Sunday. They have no idea where, where in Philippians we are, so I'm going to review a little bit, you know. So that, things like that happen, but it's safe for you to hear some of the things you've heard before because how many of us know we should eat better and we don't? <laughs> how many of us know we should spend less and we still don't? We, it's still good to hear those things repeated. And then he gives three warnings here. Look out. He says, look out three times. And you'd think there'd be a, a beware of dog sign on Paul's backyard here. But that's not what he's talking about. He says, beware of the dogs. This is quite a flip here. Remember, going all the way back to David and Goliath, right? Goliath stands out there. This guy is nine and a half foot tall. And uh, he is the champion of the Philistines. I almost said the Philippines. <coughs> the Philistines. And he challenges them. He says, hey, instead of our 30,000 against your 30,000, why don't we have a uh, one-on-one, mano a mano and whoever wins, winner take all. And we'll become your servants if you win. And he challenges them. Of course, days pass, and nobody's challenged him, and Saul is cowering back there. Even though Saul is the tallest, the Bible says he stood head and shoulders above everybody else. Goliath stood more than head and shoulders above Saul. And so David brings food to his brothers, and, and he hears all this commotion going on, all this smack talk going on down in the valley, and he's like, man, who is this guy that thinks he can challenge us? You know, how come nobody's going out there? I'll, I'll go out there. And David's like, okay, well, if you're going to go out there, put my armor on. Little boy wearing all this armor all clunky. He's like, no, I don't think I need that, but I've killed a bear and a lion. I've killed many things, even my bone, bare hands. I've killed them with the stone. And so it, it wasn't luck that David killed Goliath. I didn't mean to re-preach this whole message. It was skill. He'd been practicing it for years. But anyway, but God still guided. So he goes out there, and he kills Goliath. But one of the things that David heard from Goliath is when David goes out there with no sword, no shield, no armor on, but a sling and a five rocks in his pouch, okay, what does Goliath say? Do you come at me like I'm a dog? Okay. I love dogs. If you know anything about me, I'm a dog person. Don't care for cats, like dogs. And dogs are great pets. But in biblical days, they were not at all. Nobody had dogs for pets. Dogs were not domesticated. Dogs were very similar to raccoons. They were always around in the trash, and they carried diseases. If you got bit by a dog in biblical times, you might die. Okay? So they were, they were um, uh, scavengers. They were... They, you know, they might catch your little two-year-old and drag them off, kind of like we think of coyotes today. That's the way all dogs were back then. And this is the word, though, that Jews called Gentiles. They called them dogs. Remember the lady who came to Jesus and asked for a healing, and she was a Gentile? And he's like, my ministry right now is to Jews. And he, he, she's like, yeah, but even the dogs eat crumbs from the master's table. She referenced herself saying, hey, can I just get some leftovers? He's like, wow, and he healed her, okay? So it was a derogatory term that Jews had for Gentiles, and the people who are introducing false doctrine to the Philippian church and others are calling Gentiles dogs, and they're saying, if you want to become a Jew, you have to get circumcised. And he's saying, Paul is saying, no, no, you're the dogs. And he's talking to Jewish people saying, you're dogs. You talk about a flip, okay? Anyway, he says, also look out for evildoers. It's interesting that he doesn't say these are people who are confused. These people don't have their do doctrine exactly like us. He says they're evil. Introducing doctrine that distorts and disparages the gospel of Christ is evil. Now, there's people that you know and I know who are in churches that don't preach the 
proper gospel, they teach a false gospel, and they may not be evil, but somewhere up the chain, there are leaders who know that what they're teaching is wrong, but because it pays well or it's powerful or both, teach it anyway. And that's what Paul is calling evil. When you're teaching something that is leading people to go to hell and not to heaven, away from Jesus Christ and not towards him, that's evil. That's just, Paul has no trouble, you know, being, being politically correct. He lays it on line. The third thing he says, let, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. And it's interesting he calls it that because what they're promoting is circumcision. And he says, if it's not for the right reason, it's just mutilation. We'll talk about that more in just a second. Um, let my phone catch up with me here. All right, so circumcision. Awkward topic here this morning, but it's something that started under the Mosaic Covenant, and it was a sign uh, for to, that set the, Israel, the Israelites apart. It was something they did that nobody else did. Um, I remember when I got saved at uh, nine years old, so I did not grow up in church. And uh, when I was 15, I, I had a girlfriend there. The church name was Susie, and on Sunday night church, our pastor's preaching through the book of Romans, and he gets to the part about circumcision. And I look at Susie, and I whisper, I'm like, what's circumcision? And she turns about three shades of red and goes, go ask your dad. <laughs> you know, I didn't. I knew nothing about it. <clears throat> it's interesting. So this was a sign. It was a symbol. It did not save anybody, okay? It, it, um, it was something that was done for babies, although you'll see several passages in Scripture where adult men converting to um, Judaism would be circumcised, ouch, and uh, it's interesting, it says the eighth day. Now, this is thousands of years ago. We're talking about approximately 5,000 years ago that this thing was given. And God specifically says on the eighth day. How did they, how did they know to do that? Number one, because God told them. But why did God tell them? Well, we now know today that one of the key factors in blood co- coagulation and clotting is, the, is vitamin K. And your bo- a newborn baby does not produce its own vitamin K until after a week. So don't circumcise a baby unless you have a way of clotting the blood externally like we do it today. It won't be able to clot on its own until after seven days. So on the eighth day is when you circumcise a baby because its, ba- its body is now producing its own vitamin K and the blood can clot. Isn't that amazing that bodies, the Bible is so medically accurate? There's, I could go on with hundreds of those illustrations. Also, though, some people say, well, then if it's not required for salvation, if it's not a Jewish thing, then why do we do it today? You can do your own research on this. There's no right or wrong answer. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say if you choose not to circumcise your baby, you're not spiritual or godly. But if you do research on it, women who are married to men who are not circumcised have a higher rate of uterine and ovarian cancer. There's also several other things from a hygiene standpoint and from a health standpoint that it's recommended. Timothy who is Paul's right-hand man, who helped him write this letter, grew up where his dad was Greek, his mom was Jewish, mixed marriage, so he was ethnically diverse, and he was not circumcised. And he's traveling around with Paul, and what's Paul's practice? To go to the synagogue first. And there's Jewish people like, well, don't bring that guy in here. So Paul, in order to make it to where it was not offending anybody, had Timothy circumcised. Uh, Ouch again. So Timothy now is practicing this, and so these people who are preaching this, they're saying, yes, we believe Jesus is the Messiah. We believe that his death by resurrection saves you. But we believe you have to become a Jew first because Jesus came to the Jews first. And you have to become a Jew first in order to be saved. So therefore, if you want to become a born-again Christian, you've got to get circumcised, and then we'll baptize you. That, that sounds really close, but it's wrong. And it totally, you can say, well, Gary, what would it hurt? Because if people are trusting in this work of the flesh as part of their salvation, there's no grace. Grace that has one contribution, one human contribution to it, nullifies grace. That's what the book of Galatians is all about. Okay? You take, you know, some of you grew up in denominations where you were taught you got to get baptized to be saved. That's no different than saying you got to be circumcised to be saved. There's, that's no different than saying you got to fill out a card or pray a prayer or whatever. Now, I'm not saying if you pray to prayer, you're not saved. But if you're trusting in the prayer, you're not. If you're trusting in your baptism, if you're trusting in your good works, all those things, if you have one ounce, one iota of human contribution to salvation, it's not salvation. 
It's totally of God. It's totally of Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. So these people were called the circumcision. Today we call them Judaizers because they try to convert everybody to being a Jew first so they can become a Christian second. There's today's Judaizers, which I just described. These are people who add things to the cross of Christ and, and preach a different gospel and add some little work to it. Romans chapter 2 talks about it. It says, For there is no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward in physical. But a Jew, a true Jew, if we could read into this, is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise not from man, but from God. So basically Paul's saying a true Jew is one of a matter of the heart first, not of the outward sign. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, going back to the Levitical law here, he says, And your, your, your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the, Lord, the, love the Lord. The purpose of circumcision was a symbol of something on the outside being removed so that the tenderness of the heart could be revealed. And that's what circumcision was all about. But the Jews took it very literally that, like, no, I've had this done, so therefore I'm God's chosen people. So back to Philippians chapter 3. He says, you guys think you're the circumcision. No, we're the circumcision. And he's talking to, he's saying, we, the Philippian church, we've got a girl who used to be demon-possessed. We've got a Roman jailer guard. We've got his family. We've got a bunch of Gentiles. Half of these guys have not been circumcised. We're the real circumcision because our hearts have been circumcised. God has removed the callous from our heart and has opened us our hearts to the gospel. And who worship by the Spirit of God, not about the fleshly appearance. Jesus said in John chapter 4 to the, to, the, to the woman at the well that God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in what? Spirit and in truth. Worship is a spiritual activity. It's not about are you dressed right? Are you wearing the right clothes? Are you singing with the right person? Are we singing the right tune? Because we know that ain't happening for a lot of us, including me. We all think. We think worship is something that's outward appearance. By raising my hands the right way, it's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the spirit. Not that that won't reflect itself in physical ways, but it's not the physical first. And he says, <clears throat> he says, and we put no confidence in the flesh. He said, though I am myself, if, if you want to talk about the flesh, I'd have a lot of reason to be confident in the flesh is what Paul is saying. And if anyone else thinks he has reason for the confidence in the flesh, you want to go there? Let's go there. You want to talk about how physically you are pleasing God and how God ought to love you because of all these things. If you want to go there, let's go there. Paul's saying, you know, we're going to throw down here. He said, I was circumcised, okay? I, I'm, I'm born Jewish, okay? I was circumcised. Not only was I circumcised, I was circumcised on the right day. I'm a Jew. I was born of the people of Israel. And I'm not only a Jew, but I'm from the very best tribe of Jews. When all the other tribes ran away in rebellion and there was civil war, Benjamin stood with Jerusalem and with the king. And you guys all rebelled. And, in fact, you go back to the dispersion. A lot of Jews, when they were carried into captivity by the Babylonians and the Assyrians, they lost track of what tribe they were from. But many of the Benjaminites didn't. And so they could, Paul could say, I, only, I not only know that I'm a Jew, I know which tribe I'm from, and I'm from the loyal tribe. The first three in blue are things that Paul had nothing to do with. He had nothing to do with his circumcision. He had nothing to do with what family he was born in or what tribe he was born in. But the next four are all about him. He says, I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews, and that's not redundant to Israel. Israel is your ethnicity. Hebrew is your culture. What was happening in this day is they're under Roman preoccupa preoccupation, but the empire before Rome was which one? Which empire was before the Roman Empire? The Greek Empire. Okay, the, the Greeks now still ruled culture because everybody spoke Greek, but the Romans kind of merged their gods. So you got, you know, Jupiter, Zeus, whatever, a lot of parallel gods. I don't know if I got the right pair there. But anyway, it was called what it, it became Greco Roman culture. Greek was the primary driver, but Rome was the one spreading the message through the Roman roads and the empire and the military. So a lot of Jews, though, became what was called Hellenists. Yes, we're Jewish by ethnicity, but we're, you know, this is the first century. We're going to keep up with the times. We're going to be hip and know what Greek culture is all about, okay? So, but there was a lot of Jews who said, no, 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 we're not giving into that Greek culture. We are going to act like Hebrews. We're going to, so Jewishness is their ethnicity. Hebrew is their culture. Do you see the difference there? 
He said, you want to talk about Hebrew culture? I know Hebrew culture better than anybody. I not only speak, because a lot of Jews didn't even speak Hebrew. They, that was just for the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They, not all of them spoke Hebrew. A lot of them spoke Greek because that was the language of the world. He says, I know Hebrew better than all of y'all. And as, when you talk about obeying the law, I obey the law better than anybody, the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees get a bad rap, and much of it's deserved. But I've told you before, the reason the Pharisees came into existence is because the liberal Sadducees were saying, well, the Bible doesn't really mean Noah built an actual ark. And we don't really believe there's a literal resurrection. It just means that spiritually you're going somewhere. And the Sadducees were the liberals of the day, and the Pharisees were the reaction, like, no, the Bible is the word of God. It means what it says. They started for good reason, but they took it to an extreme. Um, But Paul says, I was a Pharisee of of the Pharisees. Okay, I, I was one of the strictest people in obeying the law that you can imagine. As to zeal, you talk about being zealous for what I believed. I killed people who didn't believe what I believed. Paul, you know, was on the road to Damascus. What was he going to do? To arrest and imprison and even execute more Christians. So you talk about someone who takes their faith seriously. We're not talking about, you know, you want to use a Muslim parallel. Well, I'm a Muslim. But then there's Muslims who say, no, I'll fly an airplane into a building. Okay, that's Paul saying that's how serious of a, the equivalent of a Muslim I was. I was a persecutor of the church. And when you come to righteousness, when obeying the law, blameless. That doesn't mean he was perfect. He's saying that he was a diligent keeper of the law in every respect. <clears throat> so if you put this in today's term, imagine someone who's not truly born again. Well, you know, I've been born to the right family, the right family. I had a, a young man who grew up in my youth department named Jeff. And he was dating a girl, and her family was very wealthy. And one day, their family, after they could see this was getting serious with Jeff, they sat her down and did like an intervention. And they said, we really don't think you should be dating Jeff. She's like, why? She said, well, he's not exactly the right pedigree. I'm like, what's he, a dog? You know, I mean, that, but this, this, this is words that human beings used about other human beings. And Jeff's family wasn't poor by any means. In fact, they were upper middle class. They just weren't quarter of a million dollar upper class, you know, and he wasn't from the right family. And then there's the right side of the tracks. Oh, my family's a good family. We, we you know, we don't hurt anybody and we go to church on Sundays and you got to make sure not just you go to college, but you go to the right college, you know, and there's people who start dividing lines there. Oh, you know, oh, you went to Stephen F. Austin. Oh, okay. Well, I went to whatever, you know, school. And then there's the right kind of job, you know, you need to make sure, God forbid, your ch- children become a janitor or something like that. You know, make sure you have an upper echelon job. And then make sure you ra- marry the right kind of person, the right kind of spouse. And then these people do all these things, and they think, you know, certainly I'm acceptable in God's eyes, and I go to church on Sunday, and I wear a tie, and I do all those things. And Paul says, I count it all like it's lost. It doesn't even matter. And it's interesting you see the word counted here over and over again, and it literally is an accounting term. He's talking about when I reconcile the books, when I'm talking about debits and credits, assets and liabilities, here's what counts. He said, but whatever I had gained, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth. So let's look at this as we were doing a spreadsheet here, okay? Before he said, you know what? Circumcised, check. Of Israel, check. Benjamin, Hebrew, Pharisee, persecuted, blameless, um, it's spelled wrong, blameless. Okay, anyway, he just does all, he checks all these boxes. Look at this. I am a good person. Why would God not want me in heaven? And then he meets Jesus Christ and realizes all these things, in fact, not only are they not assets, they are hurting me. Do you see this? They are hurting me because I am trusting in these things and not trusting in Christ. I am going to go to hell because I was circumcised. I'm going to go to hell because I was a Pharisee. I'm going to be hell because I think that I'm blameless before God when actuality I am absolutely not. The only thing that counts on the prophet's side is Christ. He did it all. He paid it all. He is my all. I am nothing without him. All my righteousness are as what? Filthy rags, dried up leaves, blown away with the wind. There's nothing I can do to contribute to Christ. I am a poor, miserable sinner saved by grace of Jesus Christ. And so you know what? We know a lot of people who see things on this side and they think, okay, see, I'm okay. And that's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians, not many noble, not many wealthy, not many mighty have come to Christ. 
But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. God has chosen poor, ignorant fishermen to turn the world upside down. So that when you see this change happen, you're like, wow, how did that happen? You know, you think God would come to earth and pick out the very best athlete, the best politician, the richest people, and just use that to turn the world upside down. And there's a lot of Christian movements that try to do things that way. You know, we try to exalt athletes. You know, and I'm all for athletes in action and fellowship of Christian athletes. But sometimes we're like, oh, did you hear so-and-so is a Christian? Do you know Drew Brees is a Christian? You know he's a Christian? Like, oh, yeah, that's great. Now we got one of these big guys on our side. Maybe now people will hear the gospel. No. no. You know what, when people hear the gospel is when they see someone who is actually less educated than them and doesn't have as much money as them, and you go down the list, and yet somehow they're happier than I am. And somehow they know this Jesus that I just think I know. That's how the Lord tur- turns the world upside down. It doesn't say he hasn't chosen any mighty, any noble. It just says he hasn't chosen many. And that's by his uh, sovereignty he's done that. And then he says, that I'm, here's what counts, that I may be found in him. You want to do a fascinating Bible study? Just look through all the New Testament scriptures that talk about in him, in him. And then to talk about all the ones that says in Christ, in Jesus it's talking about a position, not just I believe in him, but that I'm actually placed or immersed in him. And when you're in Christ, and here's just a few. Colossians 1.20, for all the promises of God find their yes. God says yes to all his promises where? In Christ. You're either in Christ or you're outside of Christ. There's no, there's no middle ground. 2 Corinthians 5, so that in him we might become the righteous of God. Ephesians 1, even as he chose us, how did God cho- chose us, choose us? In him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1 again, in him we have redemption through his blood. Ch- verse 10, as the plan for the fullness of time, God's overarching plan for history, to unite all things where? In him, things in heaven and in earth. Do you know the overall plan for history is to take heaven and earth and reunite them? That's the way it was in the Garden of Eden, and then there was a separation because of sin. God is reuniting everything, but how's he doing it? In him, in Christ. Verse 11, in him we have obtained inheritance, having been predestined. Verse 13, in him you also, when you heard of the word of truth, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. So if you're in Christ, guess what? There's no getting out of Christ, okay? Jesus said, all that the Father brings to me shall surely come to me. When you're in Christ, there's no getting out. You know, a lot of people say, well, you can lose your salvation. Not if you're in him. If you're in Christ, then he's holding on to you. That's why the letter started with that he is faithful to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. That, that it's a work of God. Verse 22 of chapter 2. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for the God by the Spirit. The church is in him and we're being built together. So verse 9 says, so I may be found in him. But how do you become in Christ? Not by your own righteousness, that's for sure. Your own righteousness keeps from keeping the Ten Commandments. You hear people say that all the time. One of the hard parts of having church in the Bible Belt, which we're kind of not totally in the Bible Belt, but we're kind of peripheral, I guess. But a lot of people think they're saved. Oh, I'm a good person. Or are you going to go to heaven when you die? Yeah, I've kept the Ten Commandments. Really? You, kept, you love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind? Have you never put any gods before him? Well, yeah, I guess I have. And you lied? Oh, yeah. That, that. You've always honored your mother and father? Yeah, and then you can go down the list. But people have this perception. But it's not by our own righteousness, but it's that which comes through what, people? Through faith, okay? This is why the Reformation happened, because you had the Catholic Church, which I grew up Catholic, teaching the majority of what they're teaching was you become a good person by keeping the law, be a good person, and there's the d- debate to come up. And so a, a Catholic monk named Martin Luther said, wait a minute. And as he's reading through the book of Romans, he's like, wait a minute. It says the just shall live by faith, and it's not of works. And he's, and he's having this wrestling, so he posts his, his thesis on the door, and the Reformation happened. But let me be really clear about something. That does not, two things. That does not mean true believers didn't exist before the Reformation, okay? Uh, my roots are Baptist, and Baptists preceded the, the Reformation. We're not part of it. We were prior to it. Uh, we can trace our roots all the way down to the Pollocans, Waldenses, and all that stuff. But I'm not saying Baptists are only one, so don't go there either. The second thing I'm not saying, so don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying Catholics can't be saved. 
Catholic, I know many Catholics that are saved, but they are saved in spite of what their church teaches, not because of it. Because on paper, their, their church teaches that it is faith and works, but I believe the Bible clearly teaches it's faith and not works. But here's what a lot of people will point to. James chapter 2 says, oh, see, it's both. See, so also faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. See, right there, Gary, you have to have both. But some will say, watch this, this is the key. You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith, and that's the key phrase there, show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. The key to James chapter 2 is what men see. You want to see something? Watch this. You want me to show you my faith? Watch my works. Okay? It's all about in the, being justified in the eyes of, God, of men. Justified in the eyes of men. Make sure you get that really clear. Okay? And then he goes on to say, do you want to be shown? Okay? You foolish person of faith apart from works is useless. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Wow, that seems confusing. But what's the context? To be seen of men. In whose eyes was Abraham justified? By people. Okay, watch this. The Bible doesn't contradict itself, but just stay with me here. He was justified by works in the eyes of men when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar. So therefore you see, we're talking about outward appearance in the eyes of men, that faith was active along with works, and faith was completed, completed by his works. So faith is what saves, but it is demonstrated for others to see and made real in the, when you do good works that match. Now, let's go to Romans here. Paul says, what then shall we say that was gained by Abraham? What did we learn from him? Our forefather according to the flesh. It says, for if, notice the word if is hypothetical. If Abraham was justified by works, it's not saying he was. It's saying if it, he was, he has something to boast about. But watch this. In whose eyes? In the eyes of men, but not before God. In fact, Martin Luther thought the, called the book of James an epistle of straw. Because he thought it's worthless. It teaches you're saved by good works. This is what our Catholics have been teaching us here, our priests. And, and he thought it was worthless. And he didn't know how to reconcile the two because he didn't understand this principle here, that salvation is by faith. Let me, let me, instead of me talking, let's just read, okay? For what does the Scripture say? That's all that matters, right, the Scriptures? Abraham believed God, and it, his belief, was counted to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, works for his salvation, says, I've got to be good and have faith. His wages are not counted as a gift. Salvation is not a gift, but it's something you owe it to me, God. It's you're, I'm due this because look what I did. Okay? Now, and to the one who does not work, says, I can't do any good works. All my righteousness is filthy rags. I simply believe in him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted as righteousness. Do you see that? And I'm just reading through the scripture. Just as David, back in the Psalms, also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Now, either J if you read James as saying you've got to have both to be saved, then you've got to throw this verse in the trash can. Or if you're saying this is true, you've got to say James, like Martin Luther, is an epistle of straw. Or you have to read both of them in their context. Romans is saying being justified in the eyes of God, which is who's going to be your, be your judge, it's all faith. James is saying if you want for other people to see your faith is real, you better be doing some good works. You, do you see, my brethren, it to be shown, and so forth and so on. All right. So he goes back to verse 10. He says, that I may know him. Who's the him in this verse? Jesus. That I may know Jesus and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Th three ways of knowing Jesus. Knowing him personally, knowing him powerfully, and knowing him painfully. Number one, do you know him personally? Okay, there's a guy who wrote uh, the biography of Abraham Lincoln. This guy is the world-renowned expert on Abraham Lincoln. But because he did not live at the same time as Abraham Lincoln, he does not know Abraham Lincoln personally. He could tell you what Abraham Lincoln's favorite color was, every detail about his wife, about how many elections he lost prior to becoming president, what his real feelings about the Civil War and slavery were. He could tell you everything about that, but he does not know Abraham Lincoln personally, which tells you you can know a lot about Jesus and not know him personally. 
you, you've heard me quote all the time, Matthew chapter 7, that on that judgment day, many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, haven't we done all these mighty miracles in your name and cast out demons? And Jesus will look at them and says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. People doing good works in the name of Jesus who don't know Jesus. My question for you this morning is, yeah, I'm glad you come to Revolution Church. I'm glad you read your Bible. I'm glad you're on version. I'm glad you maybe sing in the praise team. I'm glad you help set up chairs. But all that means nothing if you personally don't know Jesus. Have you, have you accepted him as your Lord and as your Savior? Not that you pray some quick prayer when you were a kid at Vacation Bible School, and I'm not saying that's bad, but if that's all you did and there was no faith involved, you don't know him personally. Does he speak to you? Do you feel his presence? Do you know him personally? But you know what's sad is a lot of believers get that checked off their list and they stop there, but they don't know him powerfully. The Bible says in the last days there will be a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. People go into church, dressing nice, singing songs, but their lives on the inside are no different than their next-door neighbor because they don't know the power of God. Think about this. The power that raised a dead body and brought it back to life, not just resuscitated, but glorified it to live for, for eternity, is the power that lives inside of you if you know Jesus. That's, that, we could just stop and dwell on that for a while. Are you living that power out every day? That's the power. If the resurrection of Jesus Christ really happened and you have your faith in that, then you have been resurrected in your spirit and later you'll be resurrected in your body. But that power is alive and well today to bring about real change. Think of your worst habit. Why hasn't it been conquered? Where about the, where's the power of the resurrection in your life? I'm not saying you're lost. I'm just saying a lot of believers don't let this happen. And then a lot of believers don't go to the third step. Knowing Jesus painfully. The scripture tells us that all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You know, that's really hard to teach in America when everybody claims to be a Christian. But has anybody given you a hard time at all about your Christianity? Maybe you're a little too crazy with that Bible thing, you know? Or, yeah, you know, he doesn't want to go with, you know, the, the, the whole office after work to the bar with us because he's one of those Jesus freaks, you know? Is any of the, that even coming close in your life? The Bible says we should be ex experiencing some pain some way. But it's not just the pain of persecution, right? I mean, Job experienced a lot of pain. Paul experienced a lot of pain. We learned last week about Epaphroditus almost died because he was sharing the gospel and he got sick, and Paul didn't, didn't heal him, probably couldn't heal him. We don't know all the details of that. But there's a lot of pain in the Christian life. There is. And you, you ever wonder why? Let me, let me give you a really good reason why. When you're lost, you have a very nice enemy. The Bible says before we were saved, we were enemies of God. And when God is your enemy, but he loves you, and he's trying to help you, he's causing it to rain on the just and the unjust, your enemy is not really harassing you. In fact, he's trying to woo you. But once you cross that line of faith and you become saved, now you have an enemy who hates your guts and wants to do everything to, to destroy you, and actively. And I've heard the testimony of several believers that once I got saved, it seemed like my life started falling apart. Yeah, because you have a real enemy this time. God was your enemy only because you made him your enemy. But now Satan's your enemy because you've made a choice. And now when he was leaving you alone when you're lost, and now he's got both barrels, he's trying to bring you down. So if you're experiencing hardship, the more you try to follow Christ, don't walk away from it. Just realize, oh, I must be heading in the right direction because Satan is not happy about it at all. So suffering is part of the Christian life. It's just something we deal with. You suffer, lost people suffer. The difference is how we suffer, how we suffer. Do people see that even in spite of the cancer, in spite of the disobedient children, in spite of finances, you name your category, there's still joy there because I know that Jesus Christ loved me and he gave us all for me. Then he says in verse 11, it says that by any means possible, I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And some people look at that and say, wait a minute. Paul, you're talking like you're not saved, and now you have to do whatever it takes to get saved. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about he's already saved. Notice how, notice how the, the verse ends. Christ has made me his own. I know who I belong to. He's saying, I'm going to go through a changed body. And whether, that mean, whether it's by the means of dying or rapture, I'll take either. And remember, Paul's in prison saying, you know, I don't know whether I want to be released so I can help you more 
or if I should just get my head cut off and go straight to heaven. Whatever means God chooses by allowing me to live or allowing me to die, whatever means I know I'm going to attain the resurrection. So it's not talking about salvation. He said not that I've already attained the resurrection or think that I'm already perfect. In other words, just because I'm saved doesn't mean I quit or I plateau. Okay? Um, He's saying, but I press on to make it my own. And why? Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. I know who I have believed in and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know I belong to Jesus. I know where I'm going, but I still am striving. Isn't it really cool? Here's the Apostle Paul who wrote most of the New Testament, probably the most, what Spurgeon calls the most successful believer who's ever lived. And he goes, man, I'm not there yet. I still got a ways to go. This is written by a man who said, ends the book with don't be anxious for anything. But he says in chapter 2, I'm really anxious. And I hope that Epaphroditus lives and I'm going to send him back to you so I'll be less anxious. You know, so this is a real person here living this. He said, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But, in other words, I don't act like, okay, I'm saved. I can do whatever I want. But one thing I do, that's an interesting phrase. Do Do a study in the Bible about the phrase one thing. Psalm 27 David prays, one thing I've asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. The one thing is knowing Jesus and how beautiful he is. That, that's backed up in the New Testament. Jesus, Luke 10. Remember Mary and Martha, the sisters that are hosting Jesus for dinner? And so... They're doing all the cooking and cleaning, and Mary's all, Mary and Martha are all frantic. But when Jesus starts teaching, Mar- Mary stops helping and comes and sits at the feet of Jesus. Martha's like, what the heck? Man, I have all this to myself. No, the pot roast isn't done. And, blah, 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 blah. and she just starts panicking, and just like mother, you know, 12 hours before Thanksgiving, and all these things are happening. And she comes out and finally says, Jesus, can you do something about this? I'm doing all this by myself. And here's Mary just sitting down on the job doing nothing. And what, is, what does she what does he, what does he say? Martha, 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 just like the Brady Bunch, right, Rob? The Brady Bunch. Right. Do you know the Brady Bunch as well as your brother does? Your brother is like 1960s, 70s TV expert here, okay? Just wanted to throw that out there. This is Rob's brother, by the way. Okay, came all the way from Florida to attend Revolution Church. Good job. All right, he says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but what? One thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. What is the good portion? Sitting at Jesus' feet, adoring him. Psalm 27, Luke 10, Philippians chapter 3. The one thing is Jesus Christ. And I'm asking you this morning, have you accepted this free gift of salvation from the punishment of your sins? And if you have, is your one thing getting to know him better? You know, for many people, the one thing is the American dream. Get a good degree so you can get a good job, so you can marry a good wife and have a good house in a good neighborhood, so you can have enough money to give your kids a good education. And that's the American dream, and that's many people's one thing. And none of that by itself is necessarily wrong, but if that's your one thing, you're going to be in retirement con. what was it all about? And if you don't get all those things, then you'll, be, you'll come up empty as well. The one thing is focusing on Jesus Christ and knowing him as Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for what Paul, in prison, wrote to us so that we, a couple thousand years later, could be reading it and drawing strength from it. Lord, forgive us for being anxious about many things like like Martha. Help us to realize what the one thing is. Knowing you, Jesus. Knowing you. Lord, help us to truly believe there is no greater thing than that. Lord, I just pray that we would make uh, you our number one priority. We would seek first the kingdom of God and its King Jesus and his righteousness. And then all these little things we put in your hands that you would add them to us in your timing. Lord, help us to pursue the one thing in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so if you have questions, you can start texting those now. Next week, we will um, do the part two of windshield or the rearview mirror. Um, so let's do question and answers right now, if there are any right now. Um, here we go. Do you believe we have the same power in us as the power of Jesus? If so, does that mean we have the power to heal? Is it indicative of our level of faith in the healing power? Okay, great question. 
remember that miracles are designed and by definition to be unusual. If if walking on water was a norm, nobody'd be surprised. But when it happens, like, wait, what? That's not what normally happens. People usually sink on water. Okay? People who have leprosy normally die, but boom, this guy's healed. So Miracles by nature have to be rare. Otherwise, they become the norm, and they're no longer miracles. Um, I will go back, though, to, and it, good Christians disagree on this. I would be what would be called a cessationist. I believe that the apostolic gifts have ceased with the apostles, okay? I believe in God can do miracles. Karen Branham's a miracle, amen? I mean, they gave you only so much time to live, and here she is, still annoying us to death. I'm just kidding. Just, I had to, I've been saving that comment for, like, years until you're really good. Anyway, um, but God can heal, and you should pray that God would do the miraculous. I know that people have gone in there with a mass in their lungs, and they went to their church, and they laid hands on they prayed. They go back to the doctor, and like, I don't know what's up with this x-ray, but that lump is gone. Don't know where it went. I know God does that. But can Gary Milburn walk up to you and do this? And claim in the name of Jesus, boom, and it happens. No, I can pray for you, and I hope God answers the prayer. But I also know God can answer the prayer by letting you die. And both are his will and can glorify him. It's his choice. So healing, therefore, as a gift, I don't believe people have the gift of healing. Okay? I believe we can all pray for healing. And in James chapter 5, which was written after the apostolic era, says don't look for someone with the gift of healing, but come before your elders and be anointed. So, um, So to answer your question, I think, yes, the power of Jesus Christ, the resurrection, is still alive and well. It just manifests in different ways. Also, going back to the apostolic era, they had no New Testament. And just like Old Testament prophets, they come and say, thus saith the Lord. Like, how do we know you're talking for God? Uh, Let me call down fire from heaven. Okay, now do you believe me? And so you see every book of the Bible in the Old Testament being affirmed by miracles. You see the same thing in the New Testament. The apostles go out and we speak on behalf of Jesus Christ. Oh, well, how do we know? Well, heal a blind man. Okay, now do you believe me? And so, but they were rare because they, even again, Epaphroditus is in, in prison with Paul and he can't heal him. So we know that they're rare. So the true evidence of the power of God in your life is the change in your life. Okay. Philippians is talking about change your mind, change your heart, change your behavior through the power of the resurrection. They not only just know him personally, but know him powerfully. All right, good question. <clears throat> um, another question. Here we go. Do you believe that we all have a God-given purpose that is unique, um, our designated assignment? Yes. Um, that's, I would not just be my opinion. But um, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that, the, the grace, the faith to save you through grace is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. And we like to quote those two verses, but the next verse says, we are his workmanship or masterpiece created in Christ Jesus, there's that phrase again, unto good works, watch this, which God has before ordained that you should walk in them. There is a list of good works that God wants you to accomplish that before the foundations of the earth, he preordained. So, yes, I believe God has a specific path for you that he wants you to do. Great question. All right, uh, let's do another one. I grew up in a church, the person, not me, that always preached faith alone through grace, but lived faith and works emphasis on outward appearance. Now that I understand it contextually, it helps me to remember that faith and works relationship as outside, or now, see, now, okay, now that I understand it contextually, it helps me to remember that faith and works relationship as outside, in, or inside out. I guess that, I don't know if it's a statement or a question. If it's a question, it is definitely inside out, not outside in. And there's a lot of churches that will say, you're saved by grace alone through faith alone, but there's so much pressure on out externals that it makes you feel lost because, well, you know, I don't look like she does. I don't dress like they do. And my family doesn't seem to all have it together like they do. Maybe I'm not saved. The only way you question your salvation is if the fruit of the Spirit, not, you know, so the, the Galatians 5 talks about the works of righteousness, but then when it talks about the Christians, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Notice it doesn't say the works of the Spirit. It said the fruit, and they're all internals, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith. And it says, again, such is no law. Don't, don't try to be legalistic about it. Be about the change of the heart. Okay, You can take a guy who has a porn addiction, and he can find a way to beat it. 
But in his heart, he's still lusting after everything that moves. What change has taken place? He's just traded one set of demons for another set of demons. Okay? It's a matter of changing your heart first and foremost. All right. And here's a follow-up here. Also, not on this particular topic, but do you believe that there is power in speaking in tongues today? What do you say about churches who say that speaking in tongues is evidence of the Holy Spirit being present in the church? Many churches say it is evidence of God's presence and personal conversation between the individual and God that he, only he has understanding of. If we do not speak in tongues, does this mean we lack the experience? I just would tell, tell them what Paul told the Corinthians. Not all speak in tongues. Paul said it right there. He's talking to a church of believers and says, not all of you speak in tongues. You know, you, some of you have this gift, some of you have this gift, some of you have this gift. Desire the greatest gift, love. And he writes 1 Corinthians chapter 13 after this whole talk about spiritual gifts. The evidence is your believer is not whether you speak in tongues or not. It's whether you have love or not. And so Jesus said, by this shall all men you are my disciples, because you say, sit on my holly, ride on my holly. Right? No. He says, because you have love one for another. It's love that makes all the difference. Um, so it is not an evidence of salvation. And so to answer your first question, do I believe that speaking in tongues is for today? I'll just say this. If it does happen today, it's extremely rare. And if it happens, it needs to follow Paul's three guidelines. Paul says one at a time. How many of you have been in churches where it's everybody's going blah, 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 okay, or see on television? Paul says, no, one at a time, shut up. Number two, always with an interpreter. And where do we see the interpretation? Somebody's saying, you know, whatever, and then the someone stands up and says, yeah, what they just said was blah, 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 blah. And number three, that edifies the church. You know, this is a message the Lord gave me for this church. And I don't see, in the settings where I've ever what's happening, I don't see any of those three happening which means that they're not happening. And consider Corinthians was a very carnal church and tongues was going berserk. And also keep this in mind that Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons can speak in tongues and they do not know Jesus Christ. Hindus can speak in tongues. They do definitely not know Jesus Christ. The, the, there's a scientific term for it. I'm not saying it never happens by the Holy Spirit of God. Get me right here, okay? But there's a scientific term for it. It's called glossolalia. And it just means... You, you reach a, such an ecstatic, um, subliminal state where you're so worked up emotionally that you, call, you, you go into what's called ecstatic utterances. And notice a lot of times tongues is preceded by music that just really gets you going, 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 and finally just worked up to this euphoria. So I'm not going to say some. It's, a, it's an in-house debate. There are people who love Jesus who speak in tongues. No problem with that. Okay? I just believe it's extremely rare, and when it happens, it needs to follow Paul's guidelines or it's not glorifying God. All right, good job with the questions. Wow. We saved them all for one Sunday. All right. Well, let's stand and greet one another in the Lord, and God bless you. Have a great Sunday.